I want your soul. This all started a few hours ago. It was supposed to be my day off and I had already planned to lay around my house and eat junk food all day long. I hauled a bunch of snacks and drinks into the living room, not feeling even a little bit of regret over the few pounds I was about to put on. I turned on the TV and jumped on the couch, scrolling through Facebook while a movie played in the background on the screen. It must have been around 5 p.m. when I got bored and decided to stretch my legs a little. When I returned for my excuse for a healthy smoke break, I saw that the movie on the TV was gone and was instead replaced with one of those emergency broadcast screens with colorful rectangles. A male voice resounded from the TV. Repeat, do not leave your homes under any circumstances. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. Five seconds then paused. Attention citizens, this is an emergency broadcast for your own safety. Please lock your doors and windows immediately and do not leave your home under any circumstances. Repeat, do not leave your home under any circumstances. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. The message kept replaying. I flicked through some channels only to be met with static. At first I laughed at the absurdity of the situation. This can't be real, can it? And then it hit me. Maybe we were under attack. North Korea, or maybe it was another terrorist attack. In any case, I turned off the TV and decided to lock my doors and shut all the windows, covering them with blinds along the way. Before I did, though, I peered out the window only to be greeted with an empty street and nothing suspicious. I sat back on my couch and messaged my friend on Facebook, asking him if he saw the same broadcast. He didn't respond, though, and Messenger said he was online 10 minutes ago. As I scrolled through the rest of the feed, I saw nothing out of the ordinary on my friend's feeds. I googled the news, looking up my town, and there was nothing. I started to relax a little, beginning to think that this was indeed a prank or a technical error, but then I heard something outside. It sounded like someone cackling, but it only lasted for about a second before it stopped. I held my breath and listened, hearing another cackle in the process. It was equally short and disturbing. And then a feminine scream that was suddenly cut off. It was as if whoever was screaming was suddenly muted with a pause button. I approached the door carefully, looking through the peephole, but I saw nothing out of the ordinary. And then another very short and barely audible scream. I decided to go to the window, thinking I might see more. I slowly pulled the blinds aside, just enough to see a portion of the street, and my heart almost exploded. Standing right in front of me with her face to the glass was a woman, staring right at me. Her eyes were bloodshot and opened so widely they looked like they would pop out. She was snarling, showing teeth that were stained with dark red liquid and causing the window to fog up every second or so. Her hair was messy and dirty and her nails caked with dirt. I screamed and backed away, knocking down my table lamp in the process. I stood there for a while staring at the blinds knowing the woman was just behind them since I could occasionally hear a faint tap and scratch on the glass from her nails. And then she spoke. Open the door. Please. Please. They'll find me. I stood there dumbfounded. Please. I know you're in there. Just open the door. Please. I reached for my phone and dialed 911 with trembling hands but I was met with a deadline. I tried a few times but there was no service. Please, please let me in. Let us in. A male voice joined the woman at the window. And then another one at the door. And another and another until my entire house was surrounded by a reverberating group of pleading voices, some desperate sounding and others impatient and aggressive. I retreated to the stairs, waiting for them to go away. After what seemed like an eternity, they started shutting up one by one until I was left with a deafening silence I was grateful for. Did they get bored and decide to leave me alone? I decided to peer out my peephole to see if it was safe. When I did, I barely stopped myself from gasping loudly. Through the peephole, I could see a middle-aged man's face with bloodshot eyes, just standing there, not moving, staring at my door. Around him were more people, just staring blankly at the walls and windows. I backed away and would approach the door every few minutes since then, 
They've been standing in front of my house for five hours now. I waited and waited. I foolishly kept glancing outside to see if they had left. It was almost dark and I felt like I was losing my mind. I even contemplated opening the door thinking they might not want to harm me. And as a last resort, I held my kitchen knife close so that I can try to fight them off in the worst case scenario. Thoughts raced through my head about them breaking in and ripping me apart limb by limb with their bare hands, so I did not want to find out what they planned to do to me and how creative they were. As I sat there trying not to make any noise, I decided to peer outside one last time. Looking outside, I was faced with the same people standing in the same position, still staring at my house. But then there was a sound. Something that sounded like three deliberate gunshots a few blocks away. Almost instantly, the people jerked their heads towards the sound and without any hesitation, started sprinting towards the source. Some of them screaming along the way or making animalistic sounds. I thought there may have been like 10 or 20 of them surrounding my house, but I was wrong. As I was looking through the people to see them leaving, more and more of them just kept running past my house, almost for a whole minute, which made me think for a moment the horde would never end. But eventually all went still and there was no person or sound remaining anywhere in the vicinity of my house. That's it. I'm safe, I thought. I put my back against the door and breathed a sigh of relief. And then I heard another voice. I looked back through the peephole and saw someone across the street. A black woman and a middle-aged man were moving cautiously towards my house in a crouched position. The woman had an axe and the man seemed to be carrying a baseball bat. Come on, they'll be back soon. The woman gestured for the man to follow her and they stopped right in front of my house. Hey, you there. She tried to speak quietly but loud enough for me to hear. Hey, she knocked on the door. You need to come with us now. Those lunatics will be back soon, she said. I then clutched the knife harder in my hand and held my breath. Look, we're not one of them. Now come on, open the door. Uh, he's not going to open, the man shook his head. Come on, let's go. Maybe it was the fact that I desperately wanted to not be alone anymore in that moment, but I quickly unlocked the door and opened it slightly. Hey, I called out to them from behind the door, concealing my knife. Finally, the lady said, come on, they'll be back soon. We need to evacuate now. Wait, the broadcast says we should stay inside, I argued. Oh, fuck that. There's no help coming. Now come on, or we're leaving to the evac site without you. I knew there was no time to argue and much less time to prepare supplies to bring before those freaks returned, so I just locked my house and left the keys in the nearby bushes. I'm Angela, by the way, and this is Travis, the lady said. It should be safe to leave the neighborhood this way. I introduced myself and asked what was going on. I don't know exactly. People just started acting crazy. The town's been quarantined, but there's one checkpoint where we can get out. They got soldiers there. Travis said with his raspy voice. Should be safe to wait for this to blow over outside of town. Well, how do you know? I asked. Well, I don't know for sure, but it's our best bet. First, we gotta find our guy, Angela said. He insisted on firing a few shots to distract them and save your ass. He'll meet us at the gas station. The walk to the gas station was pretty uneventful. The streets were empty, but we did see crashed cars and a few dead bodies from a distance. I had never seen a corpse before, let alone mangled and butchered ones like these, so I tried to look away and not think how these people died. No crazy people were on the street though, or anyone alive for that matter. When we got to the station, there was a young man waiting there. He couldn't have been more than 18 years old. Ricky, nice work back there, Angela greeted him. Here's the guy you are risking your ass for. I owe you, man. I shook his hand and awaited for the group to give further instructions. Hey, Travis, you okay? Angela asked, and when I glanced at him, I saw that he was pale. Yeah, I'm just a little tired is all. I'm going to go use the restroom. He replied and disappeared inside the gas station. Ricky suggested we scavenge the remaining food in the station, so we went inside. The inside of the gas station looked like it was left in a panicked hurry. Some of the items were knocked over. The floor stained with liquid from broken bottles, and the majority of the shelves were left pillaged. Ricky assured us he had already scouted the place and that it was safe, but I still felt uneasy as if one of those people would jump me from around the corner. I gathered whatever items I deemed necessary, like chocolate bars, chips, water, and of course cigarettes. You never know when you might need them. I went into the restroom to take a leak when I heard a loud crash from inside. 
Travis, you okay? I called out. I heard his voice, but he didn't respond. It sounded like he was having a heated discussion with someone. Travis, I heard him from inside one of the stalls, so I called out his name again. He was whispering loudly, murmurs that I couldn't make out. I carefully approached the stall and stopped, but I was still listening to him. I was able to grab only a few phrases in his indistinct chatter, like, can't get away, out, 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 and feed them to something. Hey, Travis, are you all right in there? I asked, and against my better judgment, decided to slowly open the door. Before I even realized what was going on, Travis burst out of the stall and jumped on top of me, knocking me on my back. I held him back as he thrashed against me. His face was all red and his eyes were bloodshot, veins bulging from his neck and forehead so violently that they looked like they would explode in any moment. Outside, no control. Find the host, he screamed. The gibberish is spit flying all over me. Get off of me. I tried to pull him off, but he was too strong. The door to the bathroom burst open and Angela and Ricky ran in, shouting at Travis to stop it. A few moments of frenetic screaming, shouting and struggling and then Travis went completely limp. I pushed him off, only then realizing that there was a fire axe embedded in his forehead. His eyes were wide open, still bloodshot and a pool of blood was forming on the door around his head. I backed away to the wall, breathing heavily, and as the adrenaline subsided I started to feel a burning sensation all over my arms. I had deep scratches and spit from Travis all over me. Oh, no, 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 please. I stared at the scratches, my hands trembling uncontrollably. This is it, I thought. All those zombie movies I watched and this is how it ends. God damn it, Travis. I barely heard Angela say while standing over his body. She and Ricky were discussing something, but I was in my own world then. Hey, you okay? Angela shook me out of my trance. I, th I think he infected me, I said with a trembling voice. No, no, you're fine, she responded. But isn't this a virus? I think I might have gotten the virus. He scratched me and I think I got some of his spit in my mouth and on my wounds. No, no, this isn't a virus, Angela shook her head. It's a parasite and we all have it inside of us. A parasite? I was still in shock from everything that had just happened. I thought you said you didn't know what was going on. Angela sighed. I worked for the town's pharmaceutical company as a secretary. When this all started today, I got a message on the company phone from my coworker Daniel. He was very vague, but he told me not to go to work today and that it's not safe in town. He said there's a people-killing parasite which is immune to medication and that we all have it, so we should take antibiotics to suppress its growth. That's all I know, she explained. Ricky then interjected. That's crazy. I know how it sounds, Angela continued. Look, Daniel is a researcher at the lab, so I'm sure he knows something more than we do, and he's not one to exaggerate. Okay, well, where is he now? I asked. Well, I don't know. He hasn't responded to any of my messages. For all we know, he could already be dead. And the last thing he sent me was that we should evacuate via the bridge. He said the army will be there. Our best bet right now is to reach that evac point. But if we're all infected, there's no way we can leave town, I said. I know, I know. Look, the government is organizing an evacuation for a reason. They might have a cure for this, or at least a temporary solution. Ricky and I reluctantly agreed. I asked about finding some guns, but they objected, stating it would be suicide. Those freaks were very, very perceptive, and firing even a single bullet could swarm hundreds of them onto us in a matter of seconds. That meant cars were also out of the question, too. They also told me that they seemed to work as a beehive, cooperating really well with each other, not attacking their own. On top of all that, they seemed to retain some form of intelligent thinking, which explained their behavior in front of my house. By the time we stocked up with food and water, it was already dark, but Angela suggested we move now for better cover. The checkpoint was supposedly not far away, so it wouldn't take longer than an hour to reach it. We each took one antibiotic pill, which Angela had on her, hoping against hope it would slow down the parasite until we reached the checkpoint. I expected the town to be filled with screams and other inhuman sounds made by those things, and I was right. The sounds were distant, but always present all around us. A scream here, a crash there, putting all three of us on edge, carefully taking every step and frantically looking behind and around us. At one point there was a loud scream right behind us, and as we turned around we saw a naked man running one block away and disappearing around the corner. We waited, not sure if he was toying with us. A few seconds later, 
Another scream was heard from the adjacent street where the man had just vanished. The next few seconds were a mixture of two screams, one violent and blood-curdling and the other pleading, along with the sound of loud pummeling, until the latter was the only sound that remained. I wanted to help who was in trouble there, but Angela stopped me and silently shook her head no. All three of us just moved on without a single word to each other. As we neared the bridge, the horrid sounds around us slowly started fading away, until the only sound remaining was our own footsteps echoing throughout the street. After an excruciating hour of sneaking and praying that we didn't run into one of those people who would attract others, we finally made it to the bridge. There was a makeshift barricade made from barbed wire and cement bags. There were dozens of corpses strewn about the road in front and on the bridge itself. One even slumped across the barricade, making the entire scene look like a massacre. We ducked behind a wall and observed the bridge. On the other side of it at the end of the street was a tall wall which hadn't been there before. I remember asking myself how the fuck they managed to cordon off the entire city so quickly. Do you see anybody there? Angela asked. Ah, it looks deserted. I squinted my eyes trying to detect any signs of movement across the bridge. Army guys must be ahead. Let's go check it out, Ricky said. Well, wait, wait. We need to be careful here, Angela interjected. What if there's no checkpoint at all? Or if they mistake us for those lunatics? Well, what other choice do we have? We're running out of time here. I'll go first. Stay behind me and watch our backs. Ricky stood up and started towards the bridge before Angela or I could argue any further. We watched as Ricky jumped over the barricade with great finesse and we followed, carefully stepping around the dead bodies and pools of dried blood. Looking at the corpses made me feel uneasy. There were women and children here, mothers embracing their children in their final moments. Angela mumbled behind us, Oh my God! And then next to me, she said, Were all these people trying to evacuate, but they didn't make it? I don't know. I shook my head, but these people were definitely not freaks. I inadvertently started to think about what could have happened here and how these people felt in the last moments. Just as I was about to entertain that morbid thought, Ricky called out to us from across the bridge. Ah, uh, guys? He was kneeling over one of the dead bodies on the road. I don't think there's going to be an evac. What? What do you mean? I asked. He pointed to the body he was inspecting and then stood up, putting his arms on his hips. These bodies all have bullet holes in them. I think this was the army's doing, he gestured. What happened next was too fast for my brain to process. There was a glint on top of the wall, Angela screaming Ricky's name and a loud bang that echoed through the street and Ricky's head kicking forward from the bullet's impact as he went limp and fell down without a sound. The poor kid probably never even realizing what hit him. Contact, we heard someone yelled from the wall as a hail of bullets started being fired in our direction, barely missing us by a thread. Angela and I quickly stumbled backwards, running for our lives frantically while the sound of bullets persisted. We ran for what felt like miles until the gunshots faded and then finally stopped completely. We stopped in the middle of a street, breathing heavily and trying to process what just happened. But the silence didn't last for long because the sound of bullets was quickly replaced with a different, equally ominous one. The screams of the freaks which froze your bones to the marrow, bringing along with them impending doom. Their death cries were all around us now, and they were drawing closer by the second. I frantically looked around for some desperate way out of this situation. The screams were so loud now that I expected the freaks to appear from around the corner any second and swarm us. I noticed a small store with an open sign on the door. So I tried it with all my strength, hoping to God it was unlocked. To my surprise, the door easily gave way, making me stumble headfirst inside. Angela, come on, I called out to my surviving partner who seemed to be preoccupied, frantically looking around and clutching her axe. Angela, I yelled again and she snapped her head to me and practically jumped inside. I shut the door and ducked behind the counter just in time to see a dozen freaks run past us on the street, all screaming along the way and muttering some gibberish, just like Travis did. Angela and I silently stared at each other, breathing heavily and probably thinking the same thing. What just happened? The gunshots started again, but they were very distant this time. The screamers all seemed to be flocking to the sound of gunfire, which was good for us. A few more minutes passed as we listened to the 
sound of bullets and screaming with an occasional freak running past the store. Eventually, Angel and I started to regain our composure when all the outside noise died down. They shot Ricky, she said, looking down. They shot him. Listen, we need to keep moving. I approached her, glancing at the street every couple of seconds. We are not safe here. An evacuation obviously isn't happening. Do you know of any other safe places? She thought for a second with her eyes closed, as if she had trouble recalling. The only other place I know is my company, she finally responded. It's got pretty good security and... I don't know how safe it is there now, but other staff members could be infected there. Well, it's our only option now. The pharmaceutical company's not far from here, right? Yeah, yeah, we should be there in no time. I have an access card. She seemed to finally snap out of her trance and focus. All right, well, here's what we're going to do. We'll go to your company and we'll wait it out for a few days. If it has good security, maybe your coworker Daniel and some other people could be working on a cure, right? I don't know. I don't know. It's a long shot. They could all be dead or gone by now and the building could be overrun. Look, your coworker is the one who told you this was a parasite and that we can slow it down with antibiotics. He might know something more. And since the government doesn't plan to let us out, we might as well see if we can get treated first and then look for another way out of here. Okay, okay, she nodded. Let's go check out. If there's even the slightest chance of survivors being there, we need to get there. And if it's deserted, we can still stay there for a bit until we figure out our next move. And if the freaks are there, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Let's go. I clutched Travis's baseball bat and peeked outside through the glass door. It looked safe enough, so we slowly exited the store and started making our way to the destination. The pharmaceutical company is at an intersection, so we had to be real careful, Angela said. Sure enough, as soon as we exited the alleys and reached the main street, we saw a bunch of freaks scattered on the road, aimlessly walking around between abandoned cars and dead bodies. Their footsteps looked unnatural, almost as if they forgot how to walk and we were now learning it from scratch. From time to time, they would scream, shout some gibberish, or even violently cough and retch. We can use the garage to get to the entrance, Angela said, and pointed into a security barrier which opened to an underground garage. Carefully, we descended down, making sure we made as little noise as possible. The outside noise has faded once we reached the bottom, which greatly improved our morale. A lot of the cars over here seemed untouched. Only a couple vehicles were crashed and left like that so whoever had parked here never had a chance to escape. We stuck to the walls and it was a good thing too, because soon we heard another discontinued scream. We froze in our tracks trying to identify where it was coming from, but it was difficult due to the echo and the size of the garage. Another scream echoed as well. Have they found us? We waited for what seemed like ages, but nothing happened. I decided to take a peek and realized there was one man in a business suit standing in the middle of the garage. He was facing away from us, just standing and his head twitching every now and then in an uncontrolled motion. The door is right there, Angela whispered, pointing to the left of the freak. I thought about sneaking past him and there was a good chance we could have made it, but it was a gamble. Give me your axe, I told her and she hesitantly handed it to me, asking what I was doing. I looked around again to see if there was anyone else in the garage, but it seemed clear. Stay here until I take care of him and if he sees me, don't try to help me. We're both just going to get killed. I inhaled deeply and started taking very slow steps towards him. I held my breath, afraid that even the slightest noise would alert him. The man shrieked and then went silent. He hadn't seen me yet. Step by step I got closer and as I did I was able to hear him more clearly. He was muttering something between moans and head jerks. He was saying break free and can't do it, among other things. I was only a few feet away from him now. He screamed louder, which made me stop dead in my tracks. My heart was pounding a million miles per hour. This is it, I thought. He's going to turn around and in a matter of seconds his friends will join in and rip me to shreds. But he just went silent again and continued doing what he was doing before. I gripped the axe as tightly as I could, exhaling silently and bracing myself. Before I could give myself the chance to chicken out, I raised the axe above my head and brought it down with full force. He jerked his head in my direction one last time, just in time to see me, but it was too late. The axe connected with his collarbone, bringing him down to his knees with blood spurting everywhere. He tried to open his mouth to utter something, but only a soft gas came out before he fell sideways. His eyes still open as the pool of blood started to form around him. 
Oh shit, I said at the sudden realization of what I had just done. I felt sick all of a sudden and had I eaten prior to that I would have emptied the contents of my stomach. I just killed a human being. I stared at the dead body for what seemed like ages, thinking about whether this man had a family and what his name was, until I finally felt a tap on my shoulder. Hey, we gotta go. Angela reminded me and I nodded, unable to say anything. She snatched her axe from the dead body and said, You had to do it. If you hadn't killed him, you can bet your ass he would have done it to you. She approached the door and swiped her card on the reader, which made a loud beeping sound. The sturdy door unlocked and I took one final look at the man in the suit and his empty gaze, before Angela reminded me that we had to leave. She sighed as the door closed behind us. And then a male voice suddenly resounded on the loudspeakers. Angela, is that you? Daniel, she responded, looking around for the source. A moment of silence and the voice cracked back to life. Come on up to the second floor. I have something important to show you. Angela and I looked at each other in bewilderment. She led us upstairs to the second floor through the once pristine hallways that were now decorated with knocked over garbage bins, broken vending machines, and from what I could see, some staff members. We rounded the corner and reached the floor with a security sign. Angela was about to open the door, but I stopped her, recalling how they surrounded my house and tried to trick me into letting them in. For all we knew, Daniel was already dead, or worse. But before we could consider our next move, the door swung open and in front of us appeared a man in a lab coat, staring us down. Took you long enough, he said in a matter-of-factly tone and went back inside the room. We followed. Inside were a dozen monitors which were tracking movement via surveillance cameras throughout the building. I noticed movement on some of the feeds from those freaks walking aimlessly about certain sections of the building and outside, just like the ones on the street we saw earlier. Daniel sat in the security guard's chair and faced us. I only then noticed the gun next to him on the desk. Dan, I thought you were dead, Angela said. Well, my thought exactly. I heard the army's killing our own. He shook his head. I tried contacting you again to prevent you from going there, but I couldn't reach you. I'm sorry. I should have known. Angela shrugged after a moment of silence. Dan, you said this was some sort of parasite. Is there a cure for it, she asked. There's no cure, he responded with hesitation and my heart dropped. You can slow it down with antibiotics, but even then it's just a matter of time before the parasite develops resistance. We tried finding a cure, but we failed. What is this parasite, I asked. Dan sighed and nodded. Ever heard of Toxoplasma Gandhi? He asked. I didn't respond. Toxoplasma Gandhi, Dan repeated, is a parasite which can only thrive in the intestines of cats. It infects a rat and takes over its mind. It then allows the rat to become easy prey and be eaten by the cat, which ingests the parasite and voila, it lives a happy life. Now the parasite itself doesn't harm humans. It causes some minor behavioral changes, yes, but people can live with it without even knowing that they have it. This wasn't all just an accident, was it? Angela and I listened carefully, holding our breaths. No, Dan sighed, looking embarrassed. It wasn't. He continued after a short pause. The government was highly intrigued by the psychological changes T. Gandhi caused in humans, so they thought what if we could control the parasite and use it to our advantage. So they established a fake pharmaceutical company in this town and moved us to conduct the project here. They hired some citizens like Angela to retain the images of a normal company, but behind the scenes we were experimenting with, T. Gandhi. But why, I asked. Why use it? Well, lots of reasons, but the main one was creating an obedient and compliant nation. That was the initial goal, at least. After the initial success of manipulating T. Gandhi and making sure the behavioral changes it caused in humans would be the ones they desired, the guys in command gave orders to start infecting citizens. What? Angela was appalled. He took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes. We administered the parasite via throat swabs and tongue depressors. You probably remember the precaution the town had in order to prevent a possible Ebola outbreak five months ago? All citizens had to complete a mandatory throat culture and were therefore infected without even knowing it. The ones who moved out of the city in the meantime were tracked carefully. They've probably been neutralized or even arrested by now. I thought about everything he was saying for a second. I never took the throat culture, I replied. What? How? Dan asked. Well, I didn't live here by then. Well, then unless you ingested some feces which contained the specific parasite, you're probably safe. I felt a new surge of hope. I felt as if I could run for miles. And Dan continued. Anyway, everything was fine at first. 
the town's crime rate started dropping, more stability in the city, and so on. In fact, it was going so well that the top guys planned on running another experiment in which they could engineer the parasite into causing different behavioral changes and use it as a weapon of mass destruction. But then things got out of hand, Angela asked. Yeah, you got it right. People started complaining about feeling sick, and then there were reports of violent attacks, and, well, you know the rest. I've observed some of the infected, and apparently what happens is exactly like with the rats. The parasite takes control over the host. I don't know if the host is still aware, but my guess is he is. Probably like some other parasites, the host just can't control his actions. So why would the parasite cause this kind of violent behavior, I asked. Well, my guess is they want full control. They probably control most of the neurons in the host, but not all of them. My mind went back to all the things I had heard the freaks say since this all began. Find the host, no control, and so on. See this? Dan pointed to the camera feed on which we saw more of them at the front entrance, twitching and holding their head as if they were in pain. Whatever human is left in that body is fighting for control, but the parasite is too strong. Then he turned back to us. After the outbreak, the government announced evac at a few checkpoints in the city, but they changed their plans when they realized the severity of the situation. Our research team was to be extracted in case of an outbreak, but they never showed up, leaving us here to die. All those years working for them, and this is how they repay us, he said. He stood up and paced around. He raised his index finger and continued. But the government doesn't know one thing. When they moved the research here, the team was aware of a potential outbreak, and the head of the research built a secret exit unbeknownst to his superiors. That's how most of the staff escaped from here. They're outside the city already, no doubt. Wait, they got out? Angela interrupted. Daniel reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a key. This key was given only to the research team. Inside the storage on the second floor basement is a fenced off area where you can open it with this key. From there, it's a straight shot from the sewers to freedom. The superiors were always told it was a waste dump, so they never suspected anything. Well, what about you? He smiled vaguely and sat back down. There's no escape from what I've done. This is my purgatory. You better go. It's only a matter of time before the government purges the city. Just then, a loud crash was heard downstairs. All three of us glanced at the camera feed only to see the freaks crashing through the glass door at the entrance. Well, it looks like we're out of time, Dan said, and he shoved his gun to Angela. Go, he said impatiently, and I'll distract them for you. Without hesitation, Angela and I sprinted down the corridor, which already had screams reverberating throughout it, and called the elevator. We waited, hoping it would arrive before the freaks did, and when it finally did, we jumped in and hit the B2 button. The last thing we heard before the door closed was Dan's voice shouting, Over here, you infected fox, and the screams becoming even more violent, if that was even possible. The sound of their footsteps and screams echoed through the pipes all around the elevator as we descended, and we prayed it would not stop before reaching the basement. The screams grew weaker, and a few seconds later the doors opened, and we stood in a dark hallway. Another very loud shriek echoed as one of them came right at us, but before he could reach us, Angela put a bullet in his forehead, silencing him permanently. We sprinted through the dark basement until we reached a sturdy-looking door. She used the key to open it and ushered me inside the dark, cluttered room which was the storage. On the other side of the room was a gated fence, which led to a dark passage. Angela unlocked it and motioned for me to go ahead first. I rushed inside and as I did, I heard the sound of the door closing and key turning in the hall. I turned around and saw Angela standing behind the gate, a look of defeat on her face. Angela, what are you doing? I asked. She shook her head. This is the end of the line for me. Angela, maybe you're okay though, you might not be infected. I can already feel myself changing, she cried. You have to go without me. I was at a loss for words. I knew she was right, I could see it on her skin, but my brain was looking for an alternate solution. Angela wiped tears and reached into her pocket, pulling out a pitcher. She glanced at it and let out a sob. She then handed it to me and upon inspecting it, I saw it was a picture of a little girl in a school uniform, smiling widely. That's my daughter Helena, she said. Her address is on the back. Please, find her and give it to her. Angela, come on, you can give it to yourself once we're out. The screams in the distance were starting to grow louder again. She shook her head and sniffled, wiping away her newly formed tears. Promise me, she grabbed my hand through the fence firmly. Promise me you'll find her. 
I nodded and uttered the words with a trembling voice. I promise. Good. I'm going to give these bastards a memorable farewell. She dropped her backpack on the ground and readied her gun. The screams which we had heard on the upper floors prior to this were now permeating the basement in full force. Angela, I called out to her and she looked back at me. Thank you, I said. She nodded and disappeared out of the room. The next few seconds were a mixture of screams and gunshots until all that remained were just the screams again. I closed my eyes and wiped the tears. I barely had the motivation to move, but I knew I had to go. I had to get out and find Helena. The next few hours were a blur, trudging through smelly water in the sewers with barely navigatable corridors until I finally saw the rays of sunlight coming between bars of another fenced gate. It was unlocked, luckily, and I stepped outside into a canal filled with mud and probably shit. I heard the whirring of a helicopter and looked above in time to see it fly under the morning sun into the direction of the city. I glanced back, seeing the city which was now cordoned off by huge walls and military vehicles around it. They were far away from me though, so I was safe. I pulled out Angela's picture to make sure it was still in my pocket and looked at the back of it. Below the address was Angela's personal message, scrawled in a hurry, and it said, Mommy will always be proud of you, even if it means I can't always be there for you. I love you more than anything, baby. Mom. P.S. Listen to your dad while I'm not around. I suppressed the tears which I felt welling up in my eyes and put the picture back in my pocket. I changed my identity after that. News of the outbreak spread quickly and the media showed the death toll, with the names of all the people who had died, including my own. The CBDC explained the incident to the media as an unfortunate outbreak of an unknown virus. They further mentioned that the city had to be completely sterilized and that the situation was now under control. According to the news, there were no survivors.